This is my first comic I ever done. I mean, but I got obsessed. We we started talking about doing one, and it comes from a, I had written a script 20 years ago because I was out of work as an actor, and when actors are out of work, they write a movie that they're starring in <laughs> that no one will ever make. <laughs> and so I did it, and then um, and then they, yeah, they passed it that way. <clears throat> and so this story. Uh, I had gone up to Telluride, Colorado, and it was the end of the road, and I was in my 30s, and so, so I thought, this is the end of the road, it's a box canyon, it's a, there's nothing, you turn around and go back when you leave, you know, up in the mountains, and I thought, I went into a bar and sat there, and, and, I, and I thought everyone there was like reincarnated, and they're coming back, and they're back, and, and they don't know why they're there, but they're there because they've been there before, you know, dare I say, minors and hookers, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then this story hit me, like, a, like it fell in my lap. Because it was a box canyon, and back in the day, they, they held slave miners there by putting a couple of riflemen up on the ridges because it's vertical, vertical mountain. And, and I thought, that is so creepy. I mean, the, the whole thing hit me like, and then I thought of a, a, of a a kind of curse that happens, and that the, that people get isolated in the town. Now they're held in and they can't get out. If you know, if you notice, like aliens and and a lot of other stories, when you have a confined space, it makes a great story because you can follow it. It's not it's not all like you know loosely out in every direction, and it makes much more tension than. So anyway, that script got lost. I went through a divorce and all my stuff got thrown into a dumpster and that was part of it and, and I lost it completely. And so I remembered the story forever for like 20 years and then we got together writing my biography. It's not an ego trip, I promise you. <laughs> I have nothing to be egotistic about. It's, it, it's all been a struggle, like everybody. And so, so then we started talking about doing a comic and then I went to a, a show and met Tom Mandrake and we all went. <coughs> It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yes. You guys are seeing that. Okay, here's the first page. Here's, here's the, you want to pass around the prologue as a, as a whole? Since that's right. Set up for this thing. Yeah, let's do that. You want to do that? Prologue as a whole? Is, that a, is this it? Yeah, that's the uh, second section. slip through those pages. Mm -hmm. I won't be talking as long as this comic is. <laughs> so while I'm talking, ignore me. Right? <laughs> but anyway, so the, the miracle of this is it'll be like through the looking glass because we, we're doing five comics. And our belief is, and my belief has been from the beginning, that it will end up being a movie. And, and five comics equals a movie script. That's 120 pages. And that's on purpose. And I'm not promising you a movie because I don't want to disappoint anybody. But, but I tell you that it's a good story and, it's, and it's, uh, it is inevitably poignant. Otherwise, you know, I think it's poignant. <laughs> But it has a lot to do with life as we know it right now, with all the chaos and, and that kind of thing, and the things that happen to people. Also, say, I just finished the movie where I'm playing Cyrus, the king of Persia, if you can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I look about as much Persian as his, the cell phone does to a Mercedes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they, they worked on me. But, but it's like a, a story from that era, or a curse, that would go through the ages and arrive when it wanted to, not, not the next day or the next year or the next hundred years, but when it wanted to. And that's part of what our story is, so. Cyrus, king of Persia. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. <laughs> I put a tattoo on my face. I had a, like three dots on my face. And they put coal under my eyes, so I looked very voluptuous. <laughs> You know, like cold eyeliner. It's crazy. I never had so many lines in my life. You should read it, you're missing it. Oh, I'll read it when it comes out. <laughs> oh, you're one of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no, no. Go, go with that. Yeah, I'm going with that. I like that. I meant to say, you're one of those guys. I like that. No, I'll, I'll pick up the whole set. I'm, I'm good with that. Oh, it's going to be. It's, it's gonna be you, should, you should tell them about uh, ships and two dogs. That's sort of the next, the next section is introducing those guys, these characters. Oh, okay. your, the ship was your original. He, di he directed me in something, so he's still doing it, even though we've known each other a lot longer than that. 
I was I was instructed I was supposed to ask you the question, but I know that uh, that's going to get stale really hey. fast. So. Um, yeah, see, they're going to suck you in. Now he's holding it longer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the great thing about Dark, Dark Horse is that we were down at Comic Con a couple of years ago, and this is we've it's taken about a year and a half to get about up to this point. And we've only got uh, three more to do. We've done two. <laughs> we're taking our time. We're in the number three now, and four and five will be when we're ready. <laughs> but Mike Richardson at Dark Horse is a great guy. I was down there for another reason. He said, you want to do a comic? And he's like six. He's about that big. And, and, he, and I said, yeah. And he puts his hand on it and says, all right, man, it's a deal now, right? Like the mob, you know? It's a deal. <laughs> all right? No, nothing in writing, just uh, uh, uh. And I And I agreed, so there you go. It's amazing to be standing here showing you a comic book. But you guys like comics, so we're all, in, we're all a tribe. Good stuff. <clears throat> so, hey, listen, anybody got any questions? Just don't, don't hesitate. Uh, not, not regarding this comic. Book, That's okay. What's your favorite role, Jeremy? My favorite role? Yeah. Everybody asks that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> My favorite role is sitting in a theater, you know, wishing I had that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think probably Bishop was my favorite, only because it was a turning point in my life. And before that, I had serviced movies. I was a good guy. I did. I said all the lines. I did everything. But I had already trained, you know, at the Actors Studio and a lot of other places in New York. And but I wasn't doing the work that I knew how to do. And when I got Aliens, I really did the work that I knew how to do. And I played it an innocent, you know, so. It was good. You think maybe your voice maybe, maybe didn't get you those those you know true acting to you know, uh, the, nope. the work you thought you should do because you got such a distinctive voice that everybody yeah. kind of hones in on that. You know. Maybe do I have to hone my voice down? Yeah, but no. What I'm asking is, what I'm asking is, do you think maybe your voice lends you more to be a character actor as opposed to? Uh, no, my age. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> as a character. You, after a certain point, you become a character actor, and then, then they're saying, "Well, bring me a, bring me a guy that is like a young Lance Henriksen." <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, finally, it ends up. There, there's a great joke about it. It finally ends up being Lance Henriksen. Who? <laughs> you know, so it has a lifespan. We have a lifespan. Well, let's got more pages. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, because he's written dying. Right. <laughs> there's another group. And so, my favorite was that because I started doing, I was determined if I didn't see the work I knew how to do on that film, in that film, I was going to quit acting. Seriously. Why do it? Why just be a, why service things? I had an expression I wanted to give, you know, for, you know, my, my life. You know. you, somebody else had a hand up. Who was that? Yeah. Did you uh, ever approach uh, to uh, play Wayland in Prometheus? In, in what? In Prometheus. Were you ever approached to play Prometheus? Wayland? No. <laughs> no. Do you really want to hear what I think about that movie? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, the British, I get, I get, the kids here? I get pissed off. <laughs> All right. I get upset about <laughs> British because they love the sound of their own voice. Mm -hmm. It's like Snoop music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and although they're, they're brilliant at some things, uh, Aliens, to me, was it always been much grittier. I always liked the idea that it was gritty. <laughs> when I saw Prometheus, I thought, I didn't get it. I'm, I mean, I'm watching the whole movie, and I, I saw it was pretty, and I loved movie in it, you know, with, with her work. You know, she did the girl with the dragon tattoo in yeah. Sweden. Yeah. I thought she was great in it. And, and I thought some of it was great, but I didn't know what the hell I'd sat there for. <laughs> they got his head in a bag and he's still talking like, yeah, you know, it's like, just plug me into a new body, I'll be all right. It was crazy. It was like, I didn't get it. No, they didn't approach me. And I would have said no. No, no I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> The old geezer, I might have, it was an interesting role. 
And the guy that played it was a good, he's a great actor. Yeah, you know? yeah, he's a great actor. There's a lot of really good actors out there, man. I never fret over what I didn't get. Yes. You know, I'm busy making a comic anyway. <laughs> Anybody else got something? Yeah. You know, uh, last night from Norway, so it's going to be to Norway, and um, hmm? I, I see you had a last name from Norway, so you passed the switch from Norway, right? Yeah, I'm a Viking, all right. Yeah, so you have been to Norway, and have you ever been approached by uh, I I would give I give my arm to go you know make movies in Sweden or Norway or you know I mean the Scandinavian country. I've been there many times you know visiting and doing or doing a convention over there. Uh, I mean it, you take movies like Let the Right One In. That's a brilliant film. I mean it's a and it's a intimate film and it wasn't like a giant budget but it was great. It's great movies. They know how to. They tell a different story. I'm first generation, so <clears throat> all that means is that I've always wondered where I should live. You know, I was born in New York, but when I get to Norway or Sweden and those countries, I just, I feel pretty at home there. I, and I love the word Viking. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother was actually a Laplander. She ran with the caribou up across Norway, Sweden, and Finland was equivalent to a, a Native American. She's a Native Scandinavian, you know, Lapland. Lapland? What? Have you been to Lapland? Sorry? Have you been up there? To no, not yet. I gotta save something. <laughs> <laughs> I travel the world pretty much. You ready for the next one? <laughs> Here we go. And this is a story that really happened, by the way. That part. I actually narrated that for, for uh, the internet. Um, anybody else? When does the comic book series come out? 12, 12, 12. <laughs> <laughs> right after the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll see you at 12, 12, 13. <laughs> what do you get? What? Somebody was, yes? Sorry. How did you get involved with the Mass Effect series? What did you think that's right? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Mass Effect was really fun. I did a few of them. Uh, they were going to put out a thing where, oh, shit, we're losing them. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Did you take the pages? <laughs> I worked with you. Oh, cool. Hey. <laughs> So you're less interesting than you were once you were. I'm, I guess. I'm so, if you know me, is to not like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, she heard the part about I played the you know Prince of Persia. Yeah. That was a big stretch. So no, I'm not staying. Oh, wait a minute. You asked me something. Mass Effect. Mass Effect. Thank you. <laughs> they were going to make a thing that we're going to give everybody that says, hack it out. That one kind of thing. For everybody's phone. And I made a deal, by the way. If, if anybody buys all five comics that come out, I'll do their voice. I'll do their voicemail. But that means, that means they have to hunt you down at a convention with all five comics in hand. No, and I, will, I will. It's got to be ten words or less. I, mean, I can't do a monologue. But, but I will do that. I'll keep my word. I always keep my word. I've learned that's a good strategy. So. They're going to want Richard III on their voice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, now's the winter of our discontent and glorious summer by the sun of York. All the clouds that lowered on our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. I, I know the whole thing. But don't ask me. <laughs> so uh, you're getting to the end of it now. You get a sense of it? It's got a lot of stuff in it and a lot of details. And of course it's hard to read under these circumstances, but it's beautiful art. Really nice yes, stuff. Yeah. So did you say this is the first the first comic, and there'll be five. Yeah. Will you be starring in a potential movie of this? 
I'm determined. <laughs> yeah. This is through the looking glass. Like I told you, I wrote it 20 years ago. It fell away. Did the comic, and now I I can actually do it. I, you know, in my life, I can actually get this made. Maybe, maybe that's the big maybe. You know. Basically, you already got the storyboard. You just have to get the. That's right. We have. We not only have the uh, we got the story and the script, but we've got uh, the storyboards. Storyboards are right there. Yeah. Isn't this interesting? Do you like this idea? Yeah. Maybe more comic guys ought to do this. This is actually kind of tense because they're all actually looking at this work we've spent all these months on. Yeah. But we're talking about other things. They're sort of <laughs> dancing around. It's like, you, tell, you want to talk about the story? Okay. <laughs> yeah. What do you what think? What do you think? Interest in this, uh, making it a movie? What? Any studio showing interest in this movie? We haven't presented it. No. no. <coughs> Dark, Dark Horse actually owns half of that idea, you know. Yeah, you guys really are seeing it. You're seeing it for the first time. Else. No one else has seen it but you guys right now. Wow. I had the guts. Like we had the guts to try this, see what happens. So what do you think, man? What's that? It's you got any questions? Nope. We're not using you as a focus group, don't we? Because <laughs> it is what it We're is. Not. Sorry, what? That's not a one-way screen where people are behind there looking at <laughs> oh, that means there's a whole crowd of people there <laughs> with cameras and you know get zooming in on you guys. Oh, look, they're at page four. Oh, she's she's getting ill. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> well, I have to say, this comic is sort of great. Don't have a question on the right stuff. You talk a little bit about the. I, it must be something in my ears. All day yesterday, I was in noisy shit, and my ears are. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, working on the right stuff and also working with the astronauts? Yeah. Uh, here I go again. It's going to sound like I'm a real negative guy. But the, uh, the guy that wrote that book, The Right Stuff, he had never interviewed not even one astronaut. And he, he writes that story. And the part of it that bugged me, I loved working with the people, Ed Harris and all these guys, Dennis and and all of that and we were taking it kind of serious and and when we saw the movie when I saw the movie I thought they made us look like clowns a little bit except for Chuck Yeager and here look at this the guy jumped out of a balloon the other day broke the sound barrier without an airplane yeah I mean oh Chuck what a big deal <laughs> you were in an airplane yeah, Chuck Yeager had the same thing that you did that guy he what Chuck Yeager had the same thing that you did that he didn't really know the real story about what happened. Well, actually, you know who actually broke the sound barrier first? A guy named, uh, oh God, he worked for Northrop. Uh, it's, it'll come to me in a minute. But a guy actually broke the sound barrier first and the, the, the military needed a guy in the military to make, you know, make a bit of a hero out of it. Uh, they call him Ichabod Crane, the guy that actually broke it. Because he's 6'4 and he weighs 150 pounds. You know, <laughs> and always had. I'll, I'll think of it, but anyway. But that book, and he, when I saw it, I just said, you know, I became friends with uh, Gordon Cooper. I met him when we had a screening at the Kennedy Center in, in, in Washington. And we became friends and wrote a script together, actually. But uh, I love the director that tried to make that movie, but he was making a movie from a book of a guy that, that you know, I don't know. I, I don't, I didn't love the book. Anyway, I'll tell you another event that happened. They asked me to come down to Kennedy Center years later to, to help uh, induct Sally Ride into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. And I, and I got down there and I'm on a stage with, uh, the second man on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, <clears throat> and I'm standing there, and, and it's coming time for me to do the, do the talking. And I said, oh God, I didn't want to do it, because I'm, I'm with the real thing, and now I'm, I don't know why they pulled me down there to do that. And right as I was getting ready to start, a lightning burst came in with, a, with, a, with wind and rain and lightning, and we all ran inside, and I didn't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I went, thank you, God. Thank you, God. you saved my, my dignity. And theirs. Anyway, I was there for that. I met Sally. And a few other people. It was great.
That's the best thing to ever come out of me doing that movie. So, Wally Sharar asked me, uh, <coughs> he was moving to California and he said, please don't take Sigma 7 because I want that for my license plate. And I said, well, I wanted it too. <laughs> and he said, I said, but I, I won't, I promise. So, anyway. Anything else, guys? What was your experience doing the Hellraiser movie? Some of the what? The Hellraiser movie. What was your experience doing? The Hellraiser moments? Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Hellraiser movie. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's worth talking about, yeah. I shot that in Romania. And, uh, they asked you to do the first one. Yeah, they wanted me to do the first one. When he, you know, when he first came out with those. Uncle Frank. Yeah. And I had just finished uh, Aliens. And I didn't want to go. I just didn't want to do it. I, I didn't want to... I was tired after four months in London, and, and I read the script, and he's stark naked with his skin all peeled off, and that's what I read, and I went, oh. <laughs> 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 I, don't, I don't really want to go there. <clears throat> Big mistake, I think, but in a way, but in another way, I don't regret anything I say no to, or, you know, or don't get. I mean, I can't be the bride at every wedding and a corpse at every funeral, you know, I mean, it's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> so, anyway. That's all I got on that one. <laughs> yeah, when they make movies in Romania, I call them jet lag movies, because you get on a plane and fly for endlessly to get there, and you start shooting the very next day after you arrive. So you almost don't know your name, let alone, what, what are we doing in this scene? And, that, and half the people that speak in Romanian, half are Italian. Then you got a Spanish guy and an American director and a translator. And this guy is great. <laughs> he, can, he doesn't know shit. Cool. Excuse me. Excuse me, kids. <laughs> anyway, so we're almost to the end of the comic. <laughs> Got a question? Yeah, but. Uh, do you know why Millennium was canceled? Sure. Um, if, we, if we were on television right now, the ratings that we had when, we, when it canceled us would have been like a hit show. Wow. The ratings are different now because of, of cable. You know, all, of, all those cable channels. But a guy came over from the comedy network uh, to, be, to take over Fox Television. <clears throat> and he canceled us because he was going to bring in comedy and that was going to make Fox go right through the roof. <laughs> Well, he got fired six months later because <laughs> Fox just went mm -hmm. and uh, and he called me actually when he canceled us and, and I he left a message. He says, Lance, listen, call me if you want to know why I canceled it. And I said, Sure, I really want to. I want to have that conversation. <laughs> what do I care? I'm done. It's over. You know, they can't start him up again because it costs sixty million dollars oh, wow. to start a television series. It costs that much money. So once they cancel it, that's over. What was your favorite episode of that series? My favorite episode, the pilot, of course. I like the pilot. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't know what I was facing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big push to make the film now. So we'll see how that goes. Chris is involved, and the book came out, and Chris is in the book. And called Back to Frank Black. Have you been approached for that? Mm. It's fun. Who knows? Frank Black is now a geezer and I got a walker. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think about, um, I know you probably get access to a lot for uh, the Mass Effect series, but um, what was on your mind with the controversial with the ending for Mass Effect? <coughs> you know what they did? They called me back to redo the ending. Because apparently, from the people that play it, uh -huh. they went, they were very disappointed. It just ended, you know, like nothing happened. And so I, uh, they called me back. That's a, Can you know, they're up in Canada, and, they, mm -hmm. and I did a whole new, new ending. I wanted to do a, another, you know, another long, you know, like part of my diary. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It's always fun. I stand in a booth in short pants and don't shave. And 
in a, in a wife beater t-shirt. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> I'm kidding. Anybody else? You again, Mr. Viking. Yeah. <laughs> the connection with Norway, I guess. Um, can you talk a little bit about working on the NCIS when you were the sheriff? The, the director, Tom Wright, was a friend of mine and asked me to, uh, he said, there's a role in this I'd love you to come and do. I mean, would you come and do it? And he had done half of the millenniums. So I said, of course, be there. And I met all those guys and they were, they were nice guys. It was fun. And in fact, I could roll out of bed because they shot up in uh, Vasquez Rocks and I only live a mile from there. So it was all so convenient. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we got all our comic back? Not yet. Keep uh -oh. talking. <laughs> yeah, some pages have disappeared. <laughs> Would everyone please stand up? <laughs> no, seriously, you're the only ones that have seen it. This is cool. Why, why, why should I come here and not offer you something? Offer you something. What, Except what my made, big mouth. <laughs> what made you decide to release a comic? What made what, me what decide? Was, yeah, what? Um, when I was a kid, sort of their age, I, I read Tales from the Crypt. Mm. They were the goriest, wonderful, yeah. gory. Never scared me. I just loved it. Uh, you know, it was like it was like mush and candy all together in one drawing. And then McCarthy came along and told the parents to burn all comics. And and I felt really cheated, robbed, and and uh, you know, the normal stuff. And then it started to come back. Look at it now. McCarthy's, there's nothing left to him. He should be in a comic. <laughs> you know, bones and alcohol. Anyway, anyway, don't get me started on politics. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, then, I, like I said, I met Richardson up in, at, you know, at, the, at that convention you know, down in San Diego. And that started it. I had, Tom Mandrake had to teach me the steps in doing a comic. I didn't even know that, right, Joe? We didn't know the steps in that. And slowly he educated us through the first comic, which took a while. And now I'm so blown away by the work that's done. I appreciate comics even more now. I probably won't do another one after this, but <clears throat> only because I don't, well, I shouldn't say won't, can't, shouldn't, wouldn't, you know, who knows. Yeah, I've lived with this as long as millennia. That's true. We, we've actually, oh yeah, 20 years. I think. But the weird thing about uh, this is we've already worked a year and a half on it. And it isn't for the money, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any roles coming up? Any what? Any roles coming up in any future? I just finished one. All I want to do is champagne and lay on a beach right now. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's stuff in the wind. You know, there's some good ones in the wind. I, I might be going to Hawaii to make one. Which that's, a place, that's a good place for a Oh, yeah. Oh, but, <laughs> in fact, they're on a scout over there right now that leaves on the 7th, and they wanted me to go. But I, I don't really think I can. But, but I will be in Hawaii doing this one. Yeah, it's a great, great script. I spend my whole time in the thing on a sailboat. Oh, buddy. <laughs> With red sails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so what's the name of the movie you mentioned? Which that one? Just did? That I just finished? Yeah. Daniel and the Lion's Den. <laughs> <coughs> it's almost as bad as Hellraiser. <laughs> <laughs> you know that biblical stuff. God in the Old Testament was really a troublemaker, man. He was, he was like a mobster. <laughs> if you were on his team, you were good. But if you weren't, he's gonna, you're going to pay. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a happy one back in those days. 530 BC. People, I don't know how people got along at all. <laughs> Just crazy. I mean, I got so many opinions, don't I? I'm just like, <laughs> I deserve to sit at the back. Okay, you guys talk among you. <laughs> anyway, we're about there. As soon as he finishes the last pages, I guess that's good timing, you know, to say, look, Familiarity breeds contempt, and I don't want you to hate me, so we could end this on a good note. <laughs> you know? Let's go. Two more questions, and, and by that time we'll be done. Yes? 
like to know, are you still making your pottery? Yeah. At least in my head. <laughs> I mean, the problem I've got is that the uh, county of uh, L.A. County has given me so much crap that I decided I think I'm going to have to leave California to do what I want to do because mm -hmm. I, I make big platters. Mm -hmm. I don't want them telling me how to live <laughs> and taxing me to death. Right. Okay. You didn't take any pages, did you? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> That's one last one. Go ahead, buddy. You were ready to do it. Yeah, I was asking her if she had to Come on. I don't have to twist her um, arm. <laughs> okay, well, uh, what, if, if there was something you could do, just any role you could play, one role you never had a chance to play that you could There isn't, there is one. I'm, I'm, there's a potter from the 1800s named George Orr. He was a, his father was Russian, a Russian immigrant, whose father was a, a guy who worked in a foundry, but he went to pottery. And, and now, right now, one little pot about this big would sell for about $150,000. I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing because of when they were made. He was, he was so far ahead of his time in attitude and, and poetry and everything else that he lived, he had 10 kids and he was, a potter. I mean, today, at the end of someone's life as a potter, they, they add up all the money they've made their whole life, and it would be a dollar an hour. It, it's a passion thing. It's a, the love of labor, but it's also that involvement w with being your own person and running your own life through, through something you can do. It's such a big deal. But this story is hilarious. The guy was like really off off the mainstream, and I, and I want to do his life story. And he, he, his, yeah, if you look it up on the internet, it's George O-H-R is his name. It was great, he was great. And that, that's, that's something I'm working toward. I don't want to wait until I, I'm too old to do it, but, but I'm definitely going to do it. Even if I have to put the money up, which is, nobody in Hollywood should do that. <laughs> that's it, fellas. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.